Hey guys. I was sitting on this recording for a while because I was afraid the subcultures I'm frequenting may misinterpret it due to some cultural differences. The thing is I'm in the open source community and even I get a lot of uh, Windows shaming that I'm using Windows and when you're going to see Adam as a screen sharing, he's going to use a Mac that may be some red flag for some people. Another reason is that the expectations, but, but for the expectations, I just realized I have to just title it properly. So, so, so that, that one won't be an issue there. Um, well, yet I'm still adding this monologue, you know, <laughs> so I guess that's a contradiction. Anyway, uh, <coughs> sorry, coronavirus. So what I was hoping to get out of this is a complete behavior of code analysis on Bitcoin Core, but, but it was more like showcasing code skin on Bitcoin Core, which I could have seen it coming as the only currently available behavior code analysis tool is code skin. So um, I did not make my intentions clear um, anyway. Uh, this does not degrade the value of this conversation or more like the potential value of it as behavior code analysis has the potential to be the next big thing in software development, I believe. I was fortunate enough to build the software and evolve it to a point where I don't have to do, I would like to do, but I cannot really do coding anymore uh, because reviews are my priority, reviewing other people's code. And this leads to the unfortunate situation where my job is basically to say no uh, most of the time uh, to things. And sometimes I can't really explain why I think that's not a good idea to change that code. But my expert intuition says because I'm most familiar with the code base that people are working on and, and I just feel like eh, you shouldn't touch that. Maybe if Lucas would have touched it, that could be fine, but uh, maybe you, you should pay much more attention to, to that part of the code than how much attention I would pay because I know it better. Uh, anyway, so, 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 so the thing is that that I have difficulties explaining why specific changes aren't good ideas, but more often I just uh, don't have time for really uh, expanding my explanation there. Uh, so I, I yeah, you, you, you have to, to be efficient too. Uh, while it is much more than that, Potentially, I think about CodeSkin as an AE, AI teammate that codifies my intuitions and gives an instant code review for the authors of the pull requests. Um, while static, compared to static code analysis tools, uh, static code analysis tools saved the world from fighting about tubs and spaces, right? That, that was a huge war and static code analysis tools, you can say that, okay, this is going to be, this project is going to be used using tubs all the time. So there is, there is no fight there anymore. However, um, <coughs> code skin or, or behavior or code analysis tools may, I think have the potential to save the software development world from fighting about who and, and how carefully should those specific people touch that specific part of the code base. Because if an experienced developer touches that part of the code base or, or the developer who wrote that code in the first place, then that's not very risky, right? Maybe it's complex, 
what he did, but the change is less risky than a new developer comes to the project and tries to do the exact same thing with the exact same complexity, let's say. Uh, so that's how I think about code skin. That's that's what it can can provide us, uh, provide me as an immediate benefit. So I think it's a huge help for for maintainership. And with that being said, enjoy this conversation on showcasing code skin on Bitcoin Core. We are going to talk about behavioral code analysis and Bitcoin Core. We have with us Andrew Cho and John Newberry and David Molnar. Andrew Cho and John Newberry are Bitcoin Core developers. David Molnar and me are Wasabi Wallet developers. Before we would start, I, I would just like to ask some basic questions from Adam. How did you what's what's your story here how did you get started in programming all right so uh thanks for having me here so i'm at thornhill and i got started with programming back in the 1980s actually i got a commodore 64 back in 1987 and uh, after a while i started to think hmm i wonder how to program those games so i started out doing that learn taught myself uh, basic and uh, then i went on to code in machine code and yeah, I've basically been hooked since then. So I've been, and I've been a professional software developer, which basically just means someone started paying me for something I would do anyway, uh, since uh, 1997. So 23 years now, and still going for it. And you heard about Bitcoin before? Yes, I've uh, heard uh, lots about Bitcoin, uh, but uh, and I actually I've been to some uh, sessions. I have a. I would say a decent introduction to it, but I'm by no means an expert on it. It's not really my field, but I find it interesting. Yeah, pay attention. There is a lot of scam out there, but the developer community generally is is is, uh, is something that's that's not uh, not about scams. So, which uh, brings us to Bitcoin Core, right? Because that's the largest. Uh, and source Bitcoin development uh, code base, and that's what we are going to analyze. Other question I would have is, so what is behavioral code analysis? So behavioral code analysis is a new and very different direction from traditional code analysis. So if you do a traditional static uh, code analysis, you tend to emphasize the code. That's what's important. That's what you're analyzing after all. Behavior code analysis is very different because in our behavior code analysis, we are interested in properties of the code. We are interested in what the source code looks like and its properties, but we tend to value the process leading up to that code more. And what I mean by that is that it's, to me, it's more interesting to find what kind of patterns can we identify in the way the development organization interacts with the source code that they are building. And by mining those patterns and by analyzing those patterns, we can do a lot of really cool stuff. So we can use those patterns in how the system grow to identify technical depth. We can use it to prioritize technical depth. And we can also get insights into the organizational side of code. Like how does it look with multiple development teams? Are there any coordination bottlenecks in the code? Stuff like that that I hope to show you later today. Thank you. So. The very core approach of it, if I understand well, is is the the basic idea that code that changes frequently and complex are the ones that you really hate to work on. Uh, is is that the basic idea, or or it's it's many different ideas patched together? So I would say that behavioral code analysis, it's like an umbrella of uh, a bunch of different analysis techniques. And that what they all have in common is that we, we look at the behavior of the development organizations. And what you mentioned is what I refer to as hotspots uh, that I'm going to show soon. And hotspots are indeed uh, complicated code that we have to work with often. And the idea with hotspots is, of course, that in a large scale code base and there will always be a certain level of technical depth. I do think it's inevitable. And we simply cannot attend to all of that technical depth at once, neither should we. 
because we always need to balance, you know, implementing new features versus reworking existing code that already works. So behavior code analysis, uh, that's, I think, one of the sweet spots for it is that it helps you prioritize technical depth based on the estimated business impact. Does that make sense? Yes, uh, I, I see. Thank you. Uh, one last question before we, we go into the, the screen sharing stuff is that um, what is fresh and new? So I've seen all of your videos and I've read none of your <laughs> books. <laughs> Sorry about that, but I yeah. will in the future if I I, I actually, this, this might be something that uh, after Bitcoin privacy, that, that I'd consider actually working full time on it because it's, it's a very new thing uh, and it has potential. It's, it's not, not well researched, but, but it has huge potential to be the next big thing in software development as I see it. So anyhow, the, you have a problem with cyclomatic complexity, don't you? And you are talking about cyclomatic complexity and the relationship between lines of code, the number of lines of code, and, and there isn't much difference between them. And now you wrote a blog post, the bumpy road code smell, measuring code complexity by its shape and distribution. Can you give us a summary about that? This is This is the new thing, right? Yeah, sure. So um, that's right. I'm, I'm not a big fan of cyclomatic complexity. That said, it's a metric I've been using for years. I still use it occasionally, but I don't, I don't value it that much. And the reason I say that is because um, there is some very good research on cyclomatic complexity. So there is this wonderful book called uh, Making Software that basically collects a lot of uh, empirical software research. And there is this uh, study on it where they have actually compared different complexity metrics, uh, cyclomatic complexity being one of them. And what they have found out is that this, the moment you start to control in those studies for the number of lines of code, cyclomatic complexity doesn't offer any further predictive value. So that's, uh, that, that's one of the reasons. The other reason is, and the reason I wrote the Bumpy Road article, is because I have found that you know, I, I analyze code for a living, right? I build tools around it and I apply the tools myself at different clients. And um, one thing I pretty soon noticed was that you can have two functions having roughly the same cyclomatic complexity value and you pick them up, the source code next to each other. And one of those functions, I mean, you can immediately understand what it does and you would understand how you would extend it. And then you look at the other one and it's a complete mess. You cannot make sense of it at all. And that's why I kind of realized that it, it's not that important uh, what the absolute complexity numbers are. The important thing to me is how that complexity is distributed, what shape the code takes on. And code that looks like a bumpy road, that's kind of code that puts a huge cognitive load on us. A code that makes it really, really hard for a developer to understand it and hence higher risk to maintain it and extend it. And maybe I get the opportunity to show a couple of examples later. Yes, that's a very interesting idea. So let's start moving on to Bitcoin Core. Um, but before that, I, I have something that I noticed. An I analyzed the number of code bases and, you know, you have the code head metric. And what I realized is that, well, the code bases are the Tor anonymity network that got the worst uh, code head then Bitcoin Core, the second worst, then N Bitcoin, which is a C sharp library, the third worst, and then Wasabi Wallet, uh, and then BTC Pay, which is so anyhow, what I saw there is that the pattern is very clear. The pattern is that the older the code base is, the worse code hat you give give them. Is that what you find generally too? It's, uh, it's very, very often the case. Yes, that's correct. And what I also see is that even new code bases, I've seen several rewrite projects where a company starts over, they want to re-implement an existing legacy system, and they are usually off to a pretty good start. But then after, let's say, six, seven months, uh, something tends to happen. 
And what tends to happen is that uh, after six months, that's typically where you have the first uh, deadline. You have the first promise that you need to deliver on. And the code health, it tends to take a hit at that time. And I very rarely see a project um, that kind of managed to get back after that. And I think one of the main reasons is because things like uh, code health, code quality, all that kind of stuff, it's its almost invisible to non-technical stakeholders. So it's very hard to communicate to them and explain that, hey, really need to invest in improvements here. So that's another area where I think behavioral code analysis has a lot to offer. All right. Thank you. And next, I would like to, to go into Bitcoin Core. With Andrew Cho, we specified the architectural components in code scheme, which is your software that is that is doing the, the 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 behavioral code analysis right now. And Andrew, uh, what what did you think of of code skin so far? Or of what was your first impression? So my impression was that uh, what it identified as hotspots were exactly where we all knew there were hotspots. <laughs> um, there weren't the results weren't surprising uh, because. These are all places that we were actively changing and were uh, known to change very frequently. Mm -hmm. Let's start screen sharing. Yeah, could you explain what we are seeing yeah. right here? <laughs> I think that's a good thing that I start to explain and show you a, a use case for the hotspots. And um, then you can interrupt me at any time and ask questions. All right. So this is uh, the Bitcoin code base running in code scene. And the only thing I've done to it is that I pointed codes into the repository. And I also added a definition of uh, your architectural components. And I'm going to get back to the architectural components later. Now, this code base is, uh, I would say, a mid-sized code base, roughly 220,000 lines of code. That's still a, a plenty of code, right? We also see we might still have a couple of aliases here, but we see that there have been a lot of contributors. More than 600 people have contributed to this code. So congratulations on that and getting so many contributors. It's, it's always fascinating to see. My point is that with 220,000 lines of code and uh, 600 total contributors, it becomes pretty hard to maintain a uh, holistic mental model of what this code really looks like. And I think it's also challenging because with, I've seen that you have a very high developer activity here. And that also means that this code base is a moving target. So what we knew about it last month might quickly become invalidated due to all that developer activity. And I know that you're part of the core team, so you managed to stay on top of this via the code reviews and pull requests. but. I see that a lot in the industry that uh, in particular non-technical stakeholders might have a really, really hard time to see what's going on with the code because source code is simply not accessible. So when I demonstrate behavioral code analysis, I typically start with what I call an interactive hotspot map. So let me click on that and I'm going to return to the dashboard here soon. So here we go. So. What we see here on screen is um, roughly 220,000 lines of code. And you see those large circles here, the one I clicked on now and the other ones here. These are different folders in the repository. So this visualization always follows the folder structure of your code. So I would guess that you recognize the names of each one of these folders as an important subsystem or a specific domain like testing. Now, the interesting thing here is that once we get to a lowest level of detail, we see that each file with source code is visualized as a circle here. And you see that they have different size. So size is used just to reflect the number of lines of code. So the more code we have in that specific module or class, the larger the circle. The interesting thing here is the color. As you might see, some of these files, these circles, they are more red than others. And that's because color is used to reflect the development activity. And the de development activity in this case is measured as the number of commits over a specific time period. So in this case, I went back one year in time. So I use 
one year back as a rolling window when I calculate what I call hotspots. And hotspots are simply these large uh, red circles. So now let's zoom out a little bit. As we see, there are a bunch of potential hotspots here in, um, in Bitcoin. We can narrow them down. I don't think we have to because it's not that many, but we could ask Codesim for help. We could click refactoring targets and Codesim would suggest the hotspots that we should look at. But let's stay with the original view here. And I'm going to drill into this one, wallet, the most red hotspot. Just because something is a hotspot, that doesn't mean it's a problem. In some code bases, you come across hotspots where the most frequently worked on code looks really, really good. And if that's the case, then you're in a very good position. So we need something more than just the hotspot criteria. We need to find out uh, about the actual code. And this is some information we can get to the right here. So first of all, we just see some basic descriptive statistics. Like we have roughly 3,000 lines of code in this file. Uh, we also see something here called code health. So code health is a metric in code skin. It's an aggregate metric. We can always uh, look at the docs where there's a bit more information. So uh, code health is basically a metric where we look at a bunch of different properties of the code. And the way we selected those properties were that we studied a lot of research and we looked for factors that are known to correlate with increased maintenance costs and increased delivery risks. And we identified, depending on programming language, uh, 20 to 30 different uh, indicators. And just to give you some examples, because uh, we're going to see them show up later. And one thing we look for, for example, is a brain method. So a brain method is simply a, a function inside a specific class that has become really, really complex, lots of conditionals. And it also tends to center the behavior of that class. So each time you want to add something to the class, you end up modifying the brain method. You said earlier that I'm not a big fan of uh, cyclomatic complexity, and uh, that's right. But what I do find has a lot of predictive value is what we call nested complexity. So nested complexity is when you have if statements inside our if statements inside our other if statements. And the reason we tend to emphasize that is because nested complexity, if you look at the research, it turns out to be responsible for roughly 20% of all coding mistakes. So it's really important to control that. One last example. Since this is a behavioral code analysis, we also look at the uh, social factors, like how many developers commit code or time to the same parts of the system. And we identify something we call developer congestion. And that's when you have lots of developer that make changes to the same parts of the code within a small time window. And that's also one factor that's known to correlate with an increased risk of defects. And I can explain that in more detail later if you're interested. Now, we have identified Wallet as a hotspot where most of the development work seems to have been done over the past year. We see that it might have some uh, code quality issues. It scores in uh, the red code health category here. Now, the interesting thing is, of course, what's the trend? What's happening to this code over time? Is it improving or is it getting worse? And this is something we can answer by looking at the complexity trend down here, which shows the evolution of this hotspot. So what this trend tells me is that the code has grown uh, quite steeply here. And then it seems to kind of level out. And towards the end of 2019, it actually looks like a part of the complexity has been removed. Maybe some dead code was removed or maybe it was a genuine refactoring. I cannot tell without looking deeper. But then we see there seems to be a slight upwards trend uh, now at the beginning of the year. So this is something I would look deeper at. Now, before I continue, are there any, anything I need to clarify so far? Uh, maybe I would ask uh, Andrew or John if they knew what happened with the complexity of the wallet. So at the end of last year, uh, a bunch of code from wallet.cpp got moved into the new file script pub key man. Uh, that's probably why the complexity dipped because it all got refactored out. So I'd actually be interested in seeing what the code health of script pub key man is because it has a bunch of the 
a bunch of code that was moved from wallet. Okay, uh, and it's uh, this one, script pub key map. Yeah, that one. So let's click on that. Oh, five. So yeah, you can uh, pretty much tell uh, just based on the trend that this is uh, code that started its life uh, somewhere else, right? So uh, yeah, this one is healthier. Okay, I see. So it looks like most of the com the complexity comes from other parts of the wallet and not all the stuff we moved away from it. <laughs> yeah, and we can look deeper at it. And um, maybe first I should cover what um, why the hotspots work so well to prioritize technical depth. So there is a, uh, let's open our second window here. This is just some descriptive data that I would like to show you. So let's look at this one. And uh, let's zoom in a little bit. So what this graph shows you is that here on the x-axis, you have each file in the system. And you see there's roughly six, 700 modules and files in total, including the analysis. And those files are sorted according to exchange frequency. That is, how often have you done a modification to them, measured as the number of commits. And that's what you see on the y-axis here. Now, what you see here is that most of your code is actually here in the long tail, which means it's rarely, if ever, touched, right? And most of your development activity is in a relatively small part of the code here at the head of the curve. So that's what hotspots do. They identify the head of the curve here, and then we kind of use code health to stick probes into those parts of the code and see are there any potential maintenance issues here. And I can just mention that um, this power law shape is something I've seen in every single software system that I've ever analyzed. It seems to be the way software evolves. So this is not just Bitcoin. This is any code base will have the same shape and distribution. All right. You touched upon a very interesting subject earlier uh, when you mentioned the refactoring you did, where you extracted, ex extracted the script pubkey man functionality. That's, of course, the question. If you have a large hotspot like this, this is still 3,000 lines of C++ code. And it's simply too big, I would say, to take on as a single refactoring target. And it's usually not a good idea because there's so much uh, domain knowledge embedded in that code that has grown over years. So it would be very high risk. So what I always recommend is to break it down into smaller actionable chunks. And one way of doing that in code scene is by using what uh, I call an X-ray analysis. So let me show you how that works. All I have to do is I press this button here that says X-ray. And what code scene does now is that it takes that code, it parses it into separate functions, and then it looks at the Git log and sees where do each commit hit over time. And then it sums it up so that we get hotspots on our function level, which is what we see here. And this is something I tend to use to prioritize the specific starting points of a refactoring. So just to give you an idea, if this was um, my code and I got, the, got tasked with um, the challenge of let's refactor this, which is always a challenge, then I would start by looking at the create wallet from file. I start to investigate that one as well as the functions it calls. And the reason I would do that is because create wallet from file has been modified 108 times, just that single function. So lots of development activity there. We also see the cyclomatic complexity. You see, I'm still using it every now and then because I find it has predictive value in the sense of how many unit tests would you need in order to cover this function. And we see that it's uh, quite high. So the typical, as a typical rule of thumb, anything beyond 15 is typically considered quite high. And here we have 71, which means we have 71 logical paths through that function. We see that the function, it's quite big, 340 lines of code. But 340 lines of code, it's still only a tenth out of the total size of the file, which was like 3,000 lines of code. And it's much smaller than the total size of the code base, which is like 220,000 lines of code. So I think more importantly, we are now at the level where we can actually start to act upon this data. And if we want, we could do a focused refactoring based on how the code actually evolves. 
Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. In fact, in Wasabi Wallet, we, we did the same thing with a cross called Wallet service that we that was our largest hotspot and slowly we we decoupled it and it's it's so much better to work with with the process transaction function now than than yeah it, it, it was very good just as a side track here that what i'm really interested in of course going to code skin and and looking at the code that that gives you somehow a static picture of it and what what we are really interested in is is to have uh, checks, uh, CI checks, uh, who request checks. So so new code can be can be added in with the idea of not ruining the hotspots because otherwise you just keep refactoring it and other people will keep ruining it, right? That's the that's the thing. Yeah, here. yeah, and I, I absolutely agree because. Uh, what I'm showing you now in all these interactive views, that's like something I do the first time I get into a new code base, right? I analyze it manually like this. And I tend to, on the projects where I work longer, and the same with other coding users, they tend to go into codes in like a couple of times a week. The people who work in sprints, they tend to use it as part of the sprint uh, retrospectives. But to really make it actionable, you really need to hook into a CI/CD, and you need to hook into things like yeah, pull requests. So this is uh, something we've been doing for uh, a year now with uh, with this version of Codesyn that I have here, which is the on-prem version. So I actually have a blog post on that. I can pull it up and uh, show you the use cases because I have a very good experience with that. So here we go. So this is an example from uh, Jenkins, but it uh, looks the same in uh, if you use it in a pull request. So basically what happens is that you can use Codesyn as a quality gate. So Codesyn will notify you if a hotspot declines in, in code health. So here, for example, we see that uh, we have a specific hotspot that we have told Codesyn to supervise. It's something called launch control, might be important. And with this uh, pull request, we degrade the code from a code of, of 8 to 2 down to 0, 7. And this means that uh, this is a, you can use this as a soft quality gate, right? So you can basically say that, all right, maybe this uh, change that we've done, it's so important that we are prepared to take on some additional technical debt and roll this through. Or you might go back to the drawing board and say, hey, maybe we can implement this feature in a different way so that we don't lower the code of but I think the key point is that this gives visibility to what's actually happened as how the system evolves. So by using codes in here in the pipeline, you won't be able to take on any more technical debt in the hotspots without it being a conscious decision, which I think makes a big difference. Now I know that you're uh, interested in uh, codes in IO, which is the cloud version of codes in. And um, last week we enabled um, pull request integration and uh, I hope that uh, this or next week, we're going to roll out uh, full support for um, other workflows. We can create pull requests from forks as well. I hope that will be coming your way really, really soon. Yeah, that, that would be great. Then I finally could put the put code skin to, to actually test it and, and, and use it in a real, real project and use it in, in a way that I would most love to. Um, can I ask uh, John Andrew? Um, Bitcoin Core has has uh, some very specific refactoring requirements, which kind of means that you can't refactor. At least uh, what I was reading on the on the contributing MD file that uh, you have very specific rules on refactoring. Uh, could you could you talk about the refactoring on Bitcoin Core? What's the relationship there? What which rules on refactoring? We I think we have a general policy of like just refactoring isn't something that we like to have because it breaks a ton of PRs. Um, so usually when we refactor things, it has to be part of a larger change. Yes. So anyway, uh, but. Well, what I was reading is new contributors should not refactor at all. 
and you should you should only concentrate on one specific topic and not open a monster pull request, right? So Bitcoin Core has this because it's a security critical software, right? Bitcoin Core has has very specific rules of of just 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 don't ruin it and 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 what I see that no no refactorings. Did you find something? Yeah, I, I found it. It's just part of our contributing .md file. Basically, with regards to a pull request that just refactors something, we we don't really like to do that because <clears throat> we have a few hundred PRs and a refactor can just break all of them and require all of them to, to or break a bunch of them and require them to be rebased, uh, which is really annoying for developers to do. So we try to discourage just making a pull request that purely refactors a bunch of stuff. Uh, and instead, like, uh, have that refactor be part of a larger change. Like for the wallet thing that happened recently, that was part of a larger change to introduce this script pub key man thing. And so while I was doing that, I refactored it, uh, refactored the wallet partially. Um, there are a few places that we don't like to touch, like consensus, but that's actually mostly been refactored before, so I don't, I don't think there would really be any problems, uh, just because it's not touched that often and it's already kind of separate. Uh, yeah, that's generally what we think about refactoring. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Adam. Continue. Yeah, so I actually think that makes uh, a lot of sense because. Um, it turns out, that, and I wrote about this in my last book called uh, Software Design X-Rays, uh, where I have a chapter I call uh, Your Best Bug Fix is Time. So there, that's also one well-researched topic, that code that hasn't been touched in a year has roughly one-third fewer defects than more recently modified code, right? So that's why I like to use hotspots also to drive and decide upon refactoring, because refactoring is something that's in the long tail of that hotspot curve. It, just doesn't make sense to me unless we know something specifically that we're going to do a lot of work here soon unless we have that external contextual knowledge I fully agree upon that that just refactoring for refactoring's sake isn't uh, a good idea yeah you know it's interesting that i i always want to refactor myself but i love to use those libraries they never refactor for example, Nicola Doriers and Bitcoin. Uh, if you look at the code base, it's uh, you want to run on, run around in the room and scream that no, this is no, <laughs> no. But on the other hand, he never broke anything in in Vasavis, and and it just works. So I I, I am still not not sure where to put this. <laughs> anyway. Let's go back to quotes. Yeah. Uh, could you yeah. share your screen again? Sure. So let's get back here. So we were uh, at Wallet CPP. We uh, did an X-ray to identify the refactoring targets, right? Uh, we looked at create wallet from file. So one thing I want to show you is that if you remember that power locker I showed you on a file level, the fascinating thing is that you have the same power locker on a function level. It's a little bit more rough, but you can still see the same overall uh, shape, right? So this is um, the change frequency amongst the functions inside wallet.cpp. So again, what this means is that if you look at it, you will see that a lot of that code is actually in long tail. So these are functions that haven't been touched for a long, long time. On the other hand, most development activity, again, is in a very small part of that overall file. So this is what I like about hotspots, that we can actually reason about refactorings from a financial perspective. We don't have to modify all code. We don't have to refactor all code, nor should we. So I hope that makes sense. All right. Um, from here, we can take a lot of different paths. I can uh, show you some of the more advanced analysis, or uh, we could uh, dive deeper into uh, a specific area. Maybe I should uh, go back to the dashboard first, just to clarify. But 
when I use CodeScene, I always start out with those interactive visualizations because I found they really helped me in building a mental model of what the code looked like. It's really helpful. It's also something that um, in many organizations, I'm not sure about you, but many organizations, they even have something like a separate test team that might do things like exploratory testing. And I found that hotspot maps work really well to guide the testing efforts as well. You just um, do a hotspot analysis limited to, let's say, the past two weeks, and you can see where the development activity has been and direct your testing accordingly. So that's another use case. Now, once I'm more familiar with, uh, with the code base and its analysis, I tend to work mostly from the dashboard here. Because as we see, we don't have to go into the visualizations. CodeSyn has already picked up the top hotspots for us. So we have here in the hotspot health, we see that wallet.cpp is the uh, top scorer here. Another thing that's interesting is that the CodeSyn tends to emphasize trends over absolute values. So what I mean by that is that in CodeSyn, you will never see like uh, 5,000 critical warnings because that amount is simply not actionable. So what we do instead is that we say that, all right, no matter what organization you are, no matter what your code looks like today, it's very, very unlikely that you want it to get worse. So we basically take the uh, previous state of the code base as a baseline, and then we detect hotspots that decline in code health. So you will see a warning here. And using these early warning systems, you can usually catch declining code very early. So if we click here, we see which hotspots we have. So we here, for example, WalletDB, we see it seems to have declined a bit. There's some, um, what looks like infrastructure for running tests that seems to decline. And from here, I can always look into it and see, all right, is this something we want to act upon? Because the earlier we can prevent a potential decline, the better. Can, can you elaborate on what, what the quote hat is? Because it, it's not really clear. I mean, yes, it's an aggregate metric, but what's, what's behind it exactly? Yeah, sure, I could. So let me pick, uh, let me pick my favorite hotspot. Let's pick uh, Wallet CPP. If I click on it here. So by the way, this is one of those uh, views that we are redesigning right now in CodeScene because I think we can make it much more clear what's actually going on. This looks a little bit too messy for my taste, I have to admit that. But here, CodeScene um, presents some of its reason, some of its rationale for assigning that code health score. So what we see here, for example, in wallet.cpp is that CodeScene claims that this is our brain class. And what that means to CodeScene is simply that that class seems to do too many different things. So most likely that code could be uh, split into smaller and potentially more cohesive units, which is something you have already done for um, one part of that behavior last year. Another thing that we see here that's weighted into code help is the deeply nested logic that codes identified. So we have something called select coins, min conf, which has a nested conditional depth of five. So that's like five if statements inside of each other. And there seems to be uh, some other functions that follow the similar pattern. Like I said initially, deeply nested logic is responsible for a significant amount of programming mistakes. And the good news are that it's usually pretty straightforward to refactor it. Then another thing that's weighted into the code health is uh, the bumpy road that we talked about early on in this uh, talk. So bumpy road is um, related to nested logic, but it's the case where you inside a single function have multiple different levels of uh, nesting. So it's like multiple logical blocks. And the reason we, um, we kind of punish that the code health is because uh, it means that a developer who's working on that code, they need to keep a lot of information in their head and it's very easy to make a mistake and slip. Another thing that goes into, there are some smaller things here that not, might not be that important. Uh, the brain methods is something that um, I tend to focus on. So brain method, like I said earlier, is uh, a function that tends to center too much of the behavior and tends to be too complex. And we see it's the same function that was also the most frequently worked on. We saw that in the x-ray analysis. 
So these are some, uh, this is something I use before I go into the x-ray just to figure out what kind of design issues might I be looking at here. Did I manage to clarify that? Yes, uh, you clarified it. So the code health is coming from uh, these ideas. Those are, are here like brain class. So what, what you explained, right? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What I find interesting is that all the things that identifies as issues are things that we are that are on the roadmap to be targeted for some changes soon. Wow, that's really cool. So it's almost like a pre log That's cool. So I'm not sure I will have a, a chance to ask this question later, but how would you compare Bitcoin Core to other code bases that you analyzed? Oh, it's uh, I analyzed the whole range of code bases. So I would say that uh, Bitcoin Core, I mean, you know, I'm coming at this as an outsider. I haven't lived with the code base. I, I don't understand the, the context. I haven't felt the pressure you felt when we feel when work on it. But as an outsider, I would say that uh, there are definitely parts that um, I would uh, look to raise the code of. Uh, for example, wallet. Uh, but in general, I find that you are in a pretty good position because when you dig deeper into the code and you actually look at the source code, which I've done as well in, um, for example, Wallet, you see that the, the low-level coding is uh, definitely follows some kind of, it looks like it follows some kind of overall style. There are some modern C++ constructs being used, which is always a positive sign. So I think this is a code base that you can... Um, can definitely continue to maintain, but I would be concerned about those uh, top hotspots. All right. I'm not sure if I may answer the question. I answered a lot of other things, maybe. I, I was more about interested in what code bases you would you would uh, say it's similar to Bitcoin Core or the complete opposite. You know. All right. Uh, so complete the uh, opposite. Uh, I think uh, it's in. You should have a look at uh, JUnit which is uh, a very interesting code base because JUnit also has a very long and rich uh, history. And JUnit is actually a code base. I'm very, very impressed that they managed to uh, keep up their code quality in a way that they actually do. To pick up one of the top hotspots and, uh, you know, it's very, very hard to come up with an improvement. It's, really, it's a really fascinating contrast to most of the code I see. And I would say... Uh, to compare Bitcoin to something, there are things like um, it's it's much larger, so it might not be that fair. But um, Android, for example, I use that for a lot of my um, case studies. Android is a platform framework base. It's a different uh, programming language. It's implemented in Java, most of it. But it faces, I would say, uh, similar issues with um, relatively large hotspots. Uh, that tend to accumulate complexity. And there's some of the same modularity issues that we saw in the top hotspots here. However, in Android, everything is exaggerated because there are hotspots are like 10 times the size of yours. So it might be even more challenging there. All right, thank you. Uh, let's continue with, uh, if, if you have something in mind, uh, yeah, what would you like to continue with here? There is still a lot of things. <laughs> Yeah, so I think I can show you um, a different kind of use case. Uh, so I can show you a little bit of a more advanced analysis because the hotspots, they are like the foundation, but then you can build up on that foundation depending on what kind of insights you want to get in the code base. So I would like to show you something that I call uh, change coupling, which is very, very different from traditional coupling. That'd be interesting. Yes. Uh, one thing that uh, are you planning to go into the the social analysis too, or or you just just didn't? Yeah, think of, okay. I, I can do that. I can show you a bit yeah, of the social analysis as well. Okay. So uh, let me cover uh, change coupling uh, briefly, and then we we'll take a look at some of the social metrics, which I personally find uh, fascinating. So change coupling. Let's see. We find it here. It used to be called temporal coupling, uh, which is a term I used in my previous book, Your Code is a Crime Scene, but it's not a good name. It's overloaded, so I changed it to change coupling. But let's click here, and now we get to see a very different view of uh, the Bitcoin Core code base. 
Now, uh, let me add an overlay here. Let's add uh, the architectural components. So we'll get the file separated, something like this. Okay. So the way you read this is that you have each file arranged in a circle here. And when I, when I hover over a specific node, I see all its dependents light up. So in this case, it means I have uh, something called uh, P2P, a uh, fear filter, a Python file, and I can see that when I change that one, I have a predicted modification in a bunch of different files. I could filter the view here and see that, all right, all of these other modules are related. And change coupling is uh, very different from the way we developers typically talk about coupling. Because when we developers talk about coupling, we tend to mean a dependency. So we have one module that uses another module or delegates to it, they depend upon each other. But change coupling is very different because change coupling is based on behavior. So the way we calculate change coupling is basically we look at the Git logs and see which files tend to be modified as part of the same commit or the same change set. And if that happens over and over again, then we know that there has to be some kind of logical relationship between those two modules. And where the hotspots are conceptually simple to act upon, change coupling is a bit more challenging but on the other hand, it can deliver some pretty fascinating findings. So I'm not sure what we can find here. Uh, we can look at it. Uh, first of all, I want to point out that change coupling in itself, it doesn't tell if something is good or bad, right? It just shows you that this is the way it is. So let me show you an example here. What do we have here? This is wallet, the red one down here that's testing. So here I see an example on what I would call good change coupling. I heard it briefly, but I don't now hear anything good. now. Now it's good. So let's get back to the screen sharing. So it could be, for example, the classic example is that you have a piece of application code that changes it together with unit tests. And that's usually a good thing. That's what you would expect. That's what you want to see. But then on the other hand, so I tend to look for more surprising things. And this is much easier for you who are well familiar with the architecture and the code base. To me, I can just look at the things that uh, stand out a little bit to me. So here, for example, I seem to have a um, bunch of different uh, functional test cases. And I see here, for example, I have something of you know, feature test for max upload target implant in Python. And I see that uh, the lifetime of that uh, particular module is tied to a bunch of different uh, units, like seven, eight different. So this is interesting. So what I would like to do now is I'd like to dig deeper. And now you need to look carefully because I'm going to show you one of the best hidden features of uh, CodeZen. So if I click on this one, I can actually X-ray a whole cluster of uh, change coupled files. So let me show you what that looks like. So here we go. So now based on those seven, eight files that co evolved I can see which functions inside each file tend to change with functions in other files. So the way you read this is that we look here, we have a P2P send headers, Python file, run test method. And we see that when we change that one, we have a run test method in one, two, three other modules that also change. We see uh, similar patterns for the timeouts and for uh, blocks. So this is also a pretty common finding and it might not be an issue, but this could also indicate things like uh, drive violations, don't repeat yourself violations. Maybe there is some uh, duplicated logic in the run tests that would be better expressed as a shared building block. Who knows? We can get more information if we look here. We get a different view of the same data. This is a tabular view. So the way you read it is you have always have couples of functions like this. So here we have uh, one feature set that changes it together with another feature set. And we see it's the run test method in both cases that seem to go well. And they change together in 87% of all commits to either one of these. So it means that if a developer modifies this run test method, there's an 87% probability that this one will end up modified as well. We see that that has happened uh, 29 times, so it's not just a fluke. One reason it happens, it might be perfectly fine, but I always like to investigate a little bit deeper. So one additional piece of information is here in the final column. This is something called similarity. 
So the similarity is coatings that copy-paste detection mechanism, because copy-paste is a very common reason for these kind of patterns. So we see we have an 87% similarity. So let's click compare and see what we find. Here we see the two run test methods next to each other. The yellow uh, parts, the, the yellow highlighting shows the differences. So let's see this. Uh, if I look quickly at this code, what I see is that see the strings are different, of course. Uh, but then there seems to be chunks of logic here which are quite similar. The only difference is that in one case, we seem to want to do a rehash as well. So based on this data, uh, one could always take a step back and say, all right, is there something where, the, where it would pay off to start to extract that functionality? Or would that be too much effort? And is it better to have it this way and uh, simply live with it? Yeah, thank you. J just a quick note, uh, John and David had to go, so three of us left. <laughs> All right. Did I manage to explain the change coupling and uh, demonstrate use cases? Yes, uh, I I understood it before. I was never really able to use it for for anything useful yet. But uh, Andrew, maybe you you've seen something surprising here. Um, not that surprising. Although it does show that we could probably merge a few tests together that do basically the same thing. Uh, it's like the, the two that we're just looking at are, I believe those are two different soft forks that we deployed and they're just checking that they, you know, the deployment works. So it's the same thing, but with slightly different parameters. So that could be something that uh, could be turned into like a function somewhere in the test framework instead of copying all the code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe, maybe it could be a data-driven test or something like that. Um, in fact, uh, this uh, doesn't look as extreme as other code bases. So um, when I demonstrate change coupling, I typically demonstrate it on, um, I think one of my favorite code bases is ASP.NET Core MVC, because they invested so much in test automation, which means you see these patterns uh, a lot. So, they're, um, so it can definitely be, a, I find it particularly useful for... Um, automated tests. Interesting. Do you want to, to explain something else here or we should move on to the social uh, analysis? I think we can move on to the social analysis. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, so as I see, the key personnel on the dashboard is, is our, our entry point. Is that correct? Yeah, or that could be a good entry point here, key personnel. So uh, the social analysis, I, they have a Lots of different use cases. I could probably talk about them for a uh, half day. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try to limit myself to one specific use case that I have found useful over and over again. So like we pointed out earlier, you had lots of contributors here, more than 600 uh, people in total, or how old is the code base? 10 years or something like that? Exactly. That's about <laughs> right. 2009, yeah. right? So, uh, yeah, so lots of people are a very long time. And since this is a popular open source project, it's uh, very common in my experience. I run an open source project as well, right? So I know that a lot of contributors, they come, they uh, they contribute to single pull request and then never return to the code base again, right? So a lot of those developers are probably like minor contributors. They have done one change and never touched it again. And this is kind of reflected in the key personnel. So even with uh, 600, total contributors, we see that more than one third of the code base is written by just five developers. So the question is, of course, always, all right, but uh, how is the knowledge distribution then? Right, what happens if one of those developers leaves? So that's one thing you can do with codes and you can actually take a look at that and simulate the impact if a core contributor leaves. But you also have some, uh, what looks like existing knowledge loss. And I have to clarify what I mean with knowledge loss. So knowledge loss in the concept of a code scene simply means that this is code written by a contributor who is no longer part of the development efforts. So it doesn't mean that no one else necessarily knows the code. Maybe you have reviewed it, maybe you have insights, but it means the person who wrote the code is no longer present, which always makes the code a bit trickier to maintain and uh, a bit higher risk. And I have to say that uh, the way I identify this 
um, the former contributors was that I asked Codesyn of a list of the give me all contributors that haven't uh, provided any code uh, during the past year. And then I simply marked them as uh, former contributors and I got this knowledge loss figure of 13%. So do you think that's a fair assessment to say that anyone who hasn't contributed in a year is uh, a former contributor? Or is there some bias in that assumption I made? I think there's a bit of bias. Um, we have people that they haven't written code in a while, uh, but they do contribute to review and um, what else? Review, like idea review and actual code review. So I wouldn't say that, like those people, I think would come up in your number of left contributors, but they haven't really left, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, that's the, that's the risk you take when um, I took a shortcut there. So what you can do, of course, is uh, you can go into Cozen and you can uh, mark and check those people who are actually uh, contributing and um, you will get actual accurate numbers. The reason I did this was because I wanted to have some data that I, I could uh, demonstrate on. So um, I can move ahead and we have to keep that in mind that it be biased. Yes, I'm very excited about finding out who are those five developers who wrote 38% of the code base. I have a pretty good guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we can have a look. Uh, let's start by uh, investigating the existing knowledge loss. So we click here. And now I get to see the same kind of map as we saw for the hotspots, only now the colors carry a different meaning. So blue means that this is code written by developers who are currently actively contributing. And red simply shows these are areas of the code written by people who haven't contributed in at least one year, right? So the way I use this is, um, again, this is not the kind of analysis I look at every single day. This is something I use every now and then when needed. So one specific case here is, um, if we zoom in, we see that there's uh, a subsystem here, the whole uh, the level DB implementation, where it seems that a lot of that uh, code was written by a former contributor. Oh, one, one now, question. Might... This, this sorry. Knowledge, sorry, just one question. This knowledge loss does not factor into the code head metric. Is that correct? No, it doesn't. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. Thank you. That's correct. Um, with level DB, actually, we should probably exclude that from our analysis because it is uh, external code, not code that we wrote. Oh, so that's, stuff nice. that's like pulled into the code base, but yeah. like we actually don't touch it. Things change upstream and we pull them in later. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. But, uh, that's uh, it's unfortunate because it's such a good case study here, right? You see a very clear band on the subsystem. Yeah, yeah that, right? Yeah, that might be an artifact of us not updating it that frequently. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, the way I would use this, if this was a real case, is that uh, I would simply use this to um, as input to planning, right? So if I, if I know that you're going to do something here in this part of the code, I would make sure to schedule additional time for learning because it is an increased risk and challenge to modify code we we haven't written ourselves, right? So if we exclude that one, it looks pretty good. Then you have uh, basically just occasional uh, occasional abandoned parts here, but uh, it's nothing that really stands out to me. You see that some of them even have a lighter shade of red, which means that there are active contributors on parts of the code. So I wouldn't worry about this at all, the existing loss. Now, what could be interesting is, of course, to see, all right, but uh, what about these five developers, right? Who are those five developers? The core developers so, uh, of the core developers. Yeah. So uh, the way Codesyn does this is that you can find out, but Codesyn makes this uh, deliberate a little bit hard for you. And the reason we do that is because um, we wanted to avoid that Codesyn is being used to kind of evaluate uh, individual computers. So Codesyn tends to put much more focus on uh, the team level because it's so easy to misuse this data. So for example, you mentioned earlier that you have some uh, former contributors that are now contributing in terms of uh, code reviews and uh, design reviews and all that stuff. So if I was uh, 
let's pretend I was a manager. I get in there and see the tail of people. They haven't done a contribution in a year. Maybe I should fire them, right? So it can so easily be misused. So we are very careful with providing us personal metrics. What we can do, however, is that we can instead uh, use it proactively and see what happens is if a core developer leaves. So let's go to the simulation module here in CodeZ. I and we see the same uh, view of the code base. Should look familiar by now. Same style. Blue means uh, code with that knowledge and uh, the different shades of gray. That's uh, existing knowledge loss. What we can do now is we can simulate what happens if a specific developer leaves. Kill, kill on so, the show there. Should I pick Andrew here? Yes. Sure, why not? <laughs> All right. So if I, let's see. Yeah, let's see. Let's zoom out a bit and let's uh, tick the box. And uh, there are more areas where we have contributed most likely, but this is uh, one of them. This is the file that, uh, this is the module you extracted, right? Yes. And uh, raw transaction, you seem to be the main knowledge owner behind that one. Is that correct? Uh, sounds slightly reasonable. I've done a lot of things in there, but... <laughs> Yeah. You've done, uh, you're not, you haven't written everything, but you have written 29% uh, of it. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. I did yeah. mess around with raw transaction stuff a long time ago. Yeah. The thing is that part of that other code, 28%, uh, is written by someone who has already left, someone I have marked as a former contributor. So we sum those together and we are about 50%. So that's why we, we flag it as a specific offboarding risk. And here codes in also, maybe you see this in visualization, it could have been done better, but you see there's a dashed border around it. So a dashed border uh, simply means that uh, codes in knows we can combine this social data with the technical data. So we know that this uh, code is relevant because it's a hotspot. So this means it's very likely that it's going to continue to evolve. And the code health is probably lower, which is why we say, all right, this is, if this was a real offboarding, this is where you want to focus uh, that mythical knowledge transfer. Yes. How about firing Peter really? Uh, let's see. Where do we have Peter we can filter? Ah, here we go. Wow. You shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this, it's, it's always pretty fun to uh, I tend to offboard myself in codes in as well. It's, uh, it's pretty fun. But it's, uh, there's a real use case behind it because these kind of things, they actually happen, right? Particularly in large organizations where uh, people might not even know each other and suddenly, suddenly someone disappears. They don't even have to leave. They might be pulled to different projects. And using this data, you have a way to actually communicate, and say, hey, look, this is going to be the impact. Maybe we should do this in a different way. That was a quick journey into some of the social metrics. There's a ton of other stuff you can do with behavioral code analysis, but they mostly require that you define some kind of team structure, right? Which might not always make sense on an open source project. Yeah. Uh, how would you do that? Maybe people from the same companies, uh, that, that would make sense there to add to, into teams. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I, I only do it for demonstrations because uh, when I demo codes and I demo on um, open source projects, so I tend to do different, uh, uh, I tend to fake the teams. For example, I define um, the people who are actually employed to work on the code base. I make them part of a core team and then I have uh, third party contributors as the second team, but uh, it's very artificial. On many closed source uh, development teams, you tend to have uh, restrict uh, teams, perhaps different scrum teams. So that's the definition I tend to use. And uh, yeah. So how about developers, do they already left the project? Can you can you show anything about that? My, my thing would be that there was someone who started Bitcoin, who's called Satoshi Nakamoto. And uh, I'm not even sure the code was in GitHub when he was around, but uh, can you show statistics about someone who left the code like uh, five, six, seven years ago, you know? Yeah, we could. We can start by I, looking I at... I think a lot of the abandoned code will either be 
Satoshi or Gavin, uh, Gavin Andreessen? You can pretty much see when it started out in Git uh, late 2009, right? Um, you see there weren't that many contributors. That's the red line. So just a couple of people. And uh, now you see it's being scaled up uh, quite rapidly here over the past years. And the development there, activity has grown up. There is some bias in that um, because uh, originally Bitcoin was an SVN repo. and um, And then people wouldn't actually write their own commits. They'd like email patches to people who would then commit them for them. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there's a bit of bias there too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's important to know. So um, analyze code like that, I typically try to, um, it, it doesn't tend to impact the, the technical metrics that much. They tend to be quite insensitive to that kind of bias, but the social metrics are obviously impacted. So I always spend some time cleaning the data. Uh, we can have a look at um, raw statistics, oh, wrong view. So this is the knowledge map, something I use as part of uh, onboarding. See if I want to figure out who has written which code. We see each uh, author is represented with a specific color. So I will typically know, all right, this is the person I should ask if I want to do something here. But what I wanted to show you was this one, the offers. So this is uh, the raw data on uh, how much um, has the individual uh, contributed here. And who was the person who started it all? Uh, S underscore Nakamoto. So here we go. Bottom of your screen. Yeah. Uh, so last contribution, 2010, 12, 15. It's recorded in Git. That, that lines up with when he disappeared. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we see that... Uh, Nakamoto contributed for uh, 14 months until that point. And uh, yeah, plenty of code, 47,000 lines of code. That's a lot. In it depends on the flow you use, right? So if uh, people uh, commit code to pull requests and then you have a specific person so responsible for merging them, the original offer will get the credit, right? We track that, we track the offer. Uh, however, there are certain workflows. Do you use something like squash commits, maybe? Uh, no, we just do straight merges. And we have like a merge okay. script that like fills in some stuff into the merge commit, but yeah, all the original commits are just merged in. Yeah, then um, then that uh, contribute those contributions are uh, tracked to original offers and uh, merge commits uh, under the hood. Unless there is some actual code modification in the merge commits, if it's just a plain merge commit, we uh, tend to filter them out. So the, the only bias I've seen is uh, if you would use the squash commits. Uh, that can bias the social metrics depending on how you do it. I've seen some uh, real horror stories. Uh, so I worked with one organization. They um, had very long-lived branches. They could go on for like a couple of months. They were uh, multiple, not only multiple persons, but even multiple teams contributing to the same branch. And towards the end, one person simply squashed all those contributions. And that means that person suddenly get the credit or blame, depending on how you look at it, for all those contributions. And that kind of just destroys the social metrics. You can't, you can't rely on them at all. And there's not really any way around it. So... If you listen to this, please don't squash commits from multiple different offers. You destroy a valuable data source. Okay. Uh, one other thing is that uh, we have a couple files that are automatically updated by our release maintainer every release. So like Vladimir is a release maintainer mm -hmm. and there's just a bunch of things that he runs a script through and they magically update something. Uh, yeah. So what that would that might affect the social metrics. To, uh, that might affect a bunch of things here, right? Um, unless we explicitly exclude them. Yeah, it definitely does. And uh, that's something you uh, typically exclude it, right? You specify that uh, I'm not interested in analyzing this specific part of the code base or these uh, particular files. Then CodeSign will clean it out and uh, you get the metrics right. So that's one part of the, the data cleaning I tend to do. All right, thank you. It was really interesting. Uh, do you have any other topics that you would like to go in? 
No, thanks. I think I covered some of the, the main use cases. Um, my recommendations always, you know, it's uh, start out with the hotspots. They are the ones that add value basically to any development organizations. And then you can use the more advanced uh, behavioral analysis uh, when needed. So that's the way I tend to use codes in myself. Okay, next question. Who is the worst developer here that you've seen? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I I really try to avoid judging. I've written plenty of horrible code myself, so uh, I've been there. It is a tricky question. Any uh, Andrew, yeah. Andrew, do you want to to ask something? Uh, join in a conversation or want to revisit something that you didn't have the chance to? Uh no, not really. And how about you, Max? Oh yeah, so um, there are two things I could recommend for you. Uh, one is that once we get access to this uh, pull request integration, one thing we do in CodeSyn also is um, we predict uh, what we call a delivery risk. And this, uh, the use case for that is exactly for uh, code reviews. So uh, let's start with what is a delivery risk. So. The way we do it in CodeSyn is basically we took a lot of inspiration from uh, how you typically do, you know, credit card uh, fraud detection. You have a pattern for how people typically use their credit card. Some suddenly you find something that deviates in an odd direction. So we try to do the same thing for code. We try to find uh, patterns in the changes that are being done in pull request. If they deviate from how the team typically contributes, that's a warning sign. And then we also weight in all that, uh, that experience level that we have for each developer under the hood, the one we use to identify key personnel, we weight that in so that a very experienced uh, contributor, they can typically make larger, more sweeping and more complex changes with lower risk. Whereas if I was going to join uh, Bitcoin Core and contribute, my initial contributions would have ha higher risk because I'm not that familiar with the code base. So we weight them together and we uh, predict the delivery risk and the way people have been using that is to prioritize code reviews because as a code reviewer, you tend to get lots of code to review. So using that um, delivery risk, you can kind of narrow it down and say, all right, this is a high risk uh, pull request. I really need to spend a bit more time on that. Whereas the other one has a low delivery risk. You cannot test it for individual pull requests yet, but you can test uh, multiple pull requests uh, together and use code to kind of uh, guide you here. So if we scroll down a little bit, where do we have here? Spitcon core, there we go. So what I use for that purpose is what I call a retrospective analysis. So it's a different button here. I click that one and now I specify how far back in time do I want to go? Uh, maybe I just want to go, uh, I don't know, two weeks back or one week back. And then Codesyn will generate a hotspot map uh, based on the activity or just those uh, past weeks. So this is, uh, so the hotspot map will look the same, but you will see, all right, this is where the shapes have been and all this code has been stable. <clears throat> so that's one I read, I think is useful and it's particularly useful if you do it on an architectural level. So here we have the definition of your architectural components. It's already mapped up. And that means we can get the hotspot map on an architectural level as well which tends to correlate better with the specific feature areas. So uh, I hope I didn't come across too confusing or did I manage to clarify it? No, that's, that's, that's very good. You know, when we are releasing in Wasabi, for example, then we are always going through all the pull requests and trying to test them that happened since the last release. Uh, but of course you're, you're missing stuff and uh, and this could actually be very useful for that. And also the architectural components, right? When when something changes in a pull request, then it says that, hey, uh, for this, you might want to test the RPC too, because there was something changing there too that was just not because an RPC functionality has been added, but because the functionality that has been added to the GUI that actually touched the RPC too, right? So I think it's okay. good news. All right. Um, thank you, Adam, and thank you, Andrew. I think it was it was a great 
great time and I'm, I'm really I'm way too excited to talk to you to be honest <laughs> it's a uh, it might be something that uh, let's say two, three years from now I would actually maybe like to work on because it has a potential that uh, could be you know the next uh, cool new thing that every software developer is using <laughs> I don't know if you how you think about it but but I, I, I see see the potential for it. I think it's, it's still very early to uh, add all. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, thank you. And uh, have a good day. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. And um, yeah, thanks for the discussions. It was really interesting to look at the code. And good luck with everything. I'm looking forward to watching the recording. Yeah, I just send you guys. Thank you. Uh, bye bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.